Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Gambia Business Podcast. I am your host, Basil Seka. We're back here again with another Gambian by the name of Mr. Ibrahim Sawane, all the way from Lagos, Nigeria. Mr. Sawane, welcome to the Gambia Business Podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. I'm grateful. Thank you very much. Hello, hi, everyone. This is Ibrahim Sawane from Lagos, as passed earlier. All right. Now, everybody will be wondering, what are you doing in Lagos, man? Yeah, uh, I work with the uh, investment bank. Uh, we focus on infrastructure. Uh, I'm within the finance division called Africa Finance Corporation. Uh, it was purely set to help in terms of supporting the infrastructure need within the African continent. All right, sounds great. Uh, before we go any further, I'll just give you the chance to do a brief introduction about your background, um, what part of Gambia you're from the schools that you've attended, and um, from there we can go into the business part of this conversation. Oh, th- thank you very much. Once again, uh, I always like to introduce myself as a village boy. I'm from the Central River region, uh, a village called Saruja. It's next to Brikamaba. Uh, I did my primary school in Brikamaba Primary School and Junior School. And I went to Nusrat Senior Secondary School in 2000, finished there in 2003. Then from there, I tried or attempted to go to University of the Gambia. I got admission, but I dropped out for a uh, reason of funding. But I didn't give up. I followed that person. I started looking for jobs. I work in uh, GT Bank Gambia. Whilst I was working there, I decided to pursue my education. I did a CAT, a Certified Accounting Technician. From CAT, I also did ACCA. Before I finished ACCA, I moved to Echo Bank in 2007. Uh, from ACCA in 2009, 2010, 11, I got a job offer to come to Nigeria. And in 2013, 14, I did my MBA with Edinburgh School of Business. And thereafter, I've been doing multiple personal development courses and programs. And the latest one being the Certified Islamic Finance Expert. All right. Well, that's great. Um, now, just talking about that certified Islamic financing expert, I mean, um, one thing that I've always not understood is, and a lot of people have asked me about this also, is the treasury bills. You have like the like the regular treasury bills and you have the Sukuk al-Islam. I mean, what is that? I mean, they, they, they are similar, but they are very different. Similar in the sense that the, the most important money in this case is, is, is government on both instruments. But the difference with Sukuk and the Treasury Bill is you are sharing risk. In Sukuk, you, 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 are, you are more or less sharing the risk of the asset. Because one thing Islamic finance does, they don't give you cars for you to go and do business with it. They create asset. That is always an online asset. Let's take, for example, government want to build a road. They have that project. They can issue a scoop. In that case, the road income from that road would be used to pay back the people they give money to. And I know it gets a little bit confused some people because they've seen that the interest on both sides are fixed. But that's acceptable in Islamic finance. As long as when the interest is fixed, it does not change. Uh, you, you will see Islamic finance too. That is, that is uh, technically nothing, something like default interest because in a pure Islamic finance, if you default on a loan, what happened? The default income does not go to the Islamic finance company. They can give it as a charity. These are some of the differences, but we could talk more about uh, the, the Sukuk and Treasury bill later in the, in, the, in the program. Okay, but like everybody knows that interest payments in Islam is haram. What's the difference there? Yeah, okay. Let's for example, we take Sukuk Alam. The Sukuk Salam in this two, that's the person you, you will invest the money in. Your proceed is used by the obligo to buy an asset. Okay. Now, that asset, the income the asset generate is where they paid you. So let's assume that that asset did not generate any income. I tell you, the Sukuk holder and not supposed to be paid. Whereas on a treasury bill, it's government who is guaranteeing that if government uses that money to go and build a road or a, a new company and that company failed from that, the government still have to pay you. But you see, on the, in a sukuk, government is not technically guaranteeing you. 
because they use your phone to invest in an asset with a belief that assets will be able to pay. In fact, you have a certificate, your certificate from your school is like a shareholder, if I put it in simple terms. Mm -hmm. You're like a shareholder with government in that project. So all of you are taking the risk of that asset. Whereas on the treasury bill, you are giving them loan. It's like a share investment and debt investment. They are two different things. Wow. So does uh does the Sukuk um operate on a uh, simple interest basis or compound interest basis? No, Sukuk does not do compound interest basis. Okay. They, they don't do compound interest basis. You fix the interest based on the price. It, it could be as simple as people used to live in commodity trading. Yes. Just put it this way. I can issue a Sukuk for me to buy, let's say, gold. For that case, or let's say oil, government is doing good for you to buy oil. As women is going to buy oil for one dollar, mm -hmm. and government believes they are going to sell this oil at one dollar fifty cent, or let's put in dollars for ten dollars, and they believe they are going to sell this oil for fifteen dollars. The profit margin there is five dollars. Yes, that five dollars. That's what they are sharing between government and the school holder. Okay. So if that if there's no profit, the school holders are going to lose. Okay. So there is actually no interest. That's a layman. You, you think that's an interest, but if you, you if you've done the structuring of a, a finance, you appreciate that the way they structure it behind the scene is where differences comes in. It's not based on interest. Okay, I think this is like uh, yeah. yeah. I I think this is very interesting. Okay, one thing that I do is I am um, a stock trader. I trade in stocks. I buy and sell stocks. So. Great. Is it a little similar because I am taking a risk there. There is no guarantee of an interest rate or anything. You know, I am, let's say I buy a Amazon stock and let's say right now it is almost at $1,200. If I buy it and it goes up, that money in Islam, how is it being turned? Because sometimes too, it can go down. That means I lose money. So, yeah. does that work the same as the Sukuk Al Islam? I mean, it's, 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 it's a bit different because if you, like I said, the Sukuk Al Islam always have an underlying asset which should be a physical asset. Right. It's a, it's a, it's a bit different because there's an asset okay. that if you give them money, they'll go and buy. Right, right, so right. The aim of Islamic finance is that let's create economic activities, not just not necessarily money activities. If you look at the modern banking we 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 what been practicing is we give money to somebody, the person go and give to another person, another person give to another person, yes. what happens? Interest rate keep on building. Let's yes. take a simple example. If I give money to you, a thousand dollars, you give it to your brother at let's say I give it to you at ten percent, you give it to your brother at twelve percent, the brother give it to somebody at fifteen percent, that somebody go and give it to a market woman at maybe twenty percent. So before you know the money I gave you from the beginning at ten percent has turned to 20% towards the final consumer. Mm -hmm. But in the Sukuk as Islam, I won't give you cash, not necessarily. You have to show me an asset you want to buy. So I'm creating an, a more economic impact. Because I say, what do you want to do with the money? You said, I want to buy a laptop to do my business. I say, okay, let me now give you money to go and buy that laptop. So I won't give you money to go and use it for any other thing. Does that make it a bit different with the, with the conventional uh, buying and saying of CR? But of course, the finance in OCS is allowed in Islamic finance. Because okay. you are selling the risks, you are selling the risks with the entrepreneur. Okay, so just one more thing on that Islamic finance. Because we here, it kind of affects us a little bit more because we stay in a non-Islamic country. Some of us here have houses. So the interest that we pay on our houses. In Islamic finance, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very interesting topic with people. Uh, Islamic finance is that all over the world they, they've been talking about the interest of uh, Muslim space in a jurisdiction where it's not a, a Muslim country. I, I read that it's a big challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, Islamic uh, interest is not allowed. Yes. But you find yourself in a society where you can't dictate what product people are going to sell to you. Yes. That is a uh, Islamic finance what call Ijara. That means lease. So yes. what Islamic finance really encourage is to to go through a lease approach where the landlord and the the, 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 the tenant will basically agree that okay, you know what, this house is let's say hundred thousand dollars and for every rent you are paid 
is split into partly for the maintenance and partly towards the purchasing of the house. In other words, whatever money they are paying to landlord, it is towards purchasing of that house. So they will split it and say part is a rental income, part is towards payment of the house. So by the time you spend maybe 30 years paying that they say, no, this house is your own. But you know, in a, in a pure rental payment, you can pay somebody a rent and the house is never on your own. Yes. A pure mortgage, if you default, they will keep on compounding the interest. And yes. in Islamic finance, in Jada, the lease, you don't compound any late payment fees. You don't compound that. Like I said, in Islamic finance, if somebody default and you see what they charge them, that proceed or you call it default interest goes to a charity. Okay. It's not allowed for, 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 for the investi- investment company to add it as their income. So, so right now, let's say I have a house and I did not default on my payment. I have a 30-year mortgage. I did not default yeah. on my payment. I'm paying my payments regularly until I pay it off. You know, okay. What's my judgment in terms of Islam? Am I, just like they say, maybe go to hell or, you know, however they say it. <laughs> like, what is going to be my judgment? There, I mean, that, that, that one now becomes more spiritual because, but the, the, the general truth is that there is no agreed school of thought on it because somebody, somebody, is, somebody is born in the U.S. is by all, it's not his fault. It's the same God that decided to bond that person in the U.S. and he found himself in the U.S. or any other country around the world. Uh, my personal opinion on it, and based on what I read from some of the great class on Islamic finance, is that you, you first of all try to look for opportunity where you can get a mortgage from a bank that will work in line with Islamic finance principle. Yes. But if you if, if you don't have that and you still need it, I mean, it's not become a uh, issue of a, a personal judgment that should I go out I think that loan, I don't have the money. If you save by yourself, if you save by yourself, it's good. But if you can't save it, on unfortunately, you, you have you have uh, no choice. But you should always be working towards exiting that position if you have opportunity. Yes. Because I, I mean, generally, if we are it's correct to tell somebody you are going to hell because I think the God is the one who judge everyone. So by committing one sin, also I I, I personally feel it we. As a man, you don't have to tell somebody you are going to be happy. Yeah, you know, people, you know, they are they are so quick at saying that, you know. So um, <laughs> <laughs> it's it, it's really nice that you explain that, you know, because I've always um, tried to find somebody who's a little bit knowledgeable about Islamic finance to explain this to me. But it's really nice that um, you did. So the way I came to know you was through treasury bills. Um, okay. Your website, Business in Gambia, I've referred it to so many people. I mean, it, there's a lot of valuable information there. Anytime you type treasury bills in the Gambia, is the one that comes up first. So, what happened to the treasury bills, man? Because last year, by this time, in 2016, the 365-day treasury bill was somewhere around 22, 22%. Yeah. But right now, since this new government took over, it's been going down every month, and now it's about six. What's going on? Yeah, I mean, the treasury bills have gone down for, for, for quite a number of uh, reasons that we can observe at the front end. Uh, there are some which you wouldn't know, but I think it's partly uh, a strategy with liberate action from the government because they have not increased their borrowing appetite from the from the local uh, and I see a lot of cash down there in the banking sector. Banks are still a lot of deposits. Um, if the saving is, is very simple in, in, in economic, if the demand is not growing, while the supply is growing, I don't know if the, what will happen, the price then will go down. So in, in, in a simpler term, the government is not borrowing more money because we've seen that with that MPC before. We've observed that the, the borrowing level has not gone up from the domestic uh, point of view. Whereas the deposit liabilities in the banks are growing, and the banks need to place that money somewhere. Of course, bankers also are not lending, not just now the money down there for, for, for a different obvious reason. But then they just put the treasury bill rates to go down. And, but it went at a very low level, as low as 3%, 5%. I do not think that one is sustainable because the government still needs something. Uh, it will likely come up uh, again. Yeah, I mean, uh, because like sometime last year, man, people were 
just just talking about it everybody was getting in it you know everybody wanted to invest in the treasury bonds uh treasury bills because like if you look at it here you know our mutual funds you know some of them are good but the average only gives you about eight or nine percent so if you if you can invest in something that's going to give you twenty two percent, I mean that's that is really good. So yes, that's, that's, that's nice. That's okay. there, there are good side. There are good side to read because uh, as a as a country, if uh, treasury bill goes down, it means the interest expense of our government is also coming down. And um, the second part is that those who are borrowing from the local market, they also pay their borrowing rates to come down as well because the monetary policy committee have reduced the discount rate uh, which most of the banks have linked their prime rate to the MPC rate. So if the MPC rate is down, it means the prime rate for commercial banks are also coming to they are also going down, which means borrowing in generally in the Gambia should also go down, which could be cheaper for business who are uh, relying on bank borrowing. So there are good side to it. I'm sort of uh, people who are going from the bank would be very happy to hear that the bill rates have gone down. But it's not good for the investors uh, like yourself and many other people who send money back home to invest. But somewhere, like if we have between 10 to 15 percent, I think that sounds more like it than the three percent. So overall, in terms of the government, this is good. Yeah, I think so. It's, it's, it's good for that. Oh, okay. Now, can you just um, describe for me, I mean, the banking sector in the Gambia, like how does the whole thing work? I mean, because I left Gambia, I mean, close to 15 years ago, and I left there like maybe three banks or so. Now I heard they have like almost 12 banks over there. I mean, what's going on, man? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a drive that came from uh, the Nigerian banking sector. Uh, a lot of banks in Nigeria uh, at the point in time uh, realized there's a need for them to expand across the region. Uh, I would say uh, because other banks have expanded, mostly uh, Eco Bank and GT Bank, they've expanded across the region. So other Nigerian banks started following the same footsteps for them to increase uh, customer base and also make good use of their, 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 their funds. So I think that puts a lot of banks to come into Gambia. Some of them have gone for various reasons. And overall, it has helped the country because it has great job for a number of people. Because I think an average bank in the Gambia may, may employ close to 100 people, some are even more than that. So that also great job for quite a number of people. And they also compete. They brought new products in this, into the system because I, if, if we check back then, we don't have ATM in the Gambia. Banks are started bringing Asian into the country. Now they came up together the central bank. They created a few forms. Even though some of us may feel like it's a bit slow, but I think they are getting there bit by bit. I mean, we feel it's slow, but I think they are getting there bit by bit. So overall, they've made some impact. I know the general public has a feeling that bankers are not lending, but I've been to banking for now almost 15 years now. So I, banking is a very well regulated sector. Everybody is looking at them. Central bank. The Minister of Finance, everybody's looking at them. If one bank fails, it can create what we call systematic risk. So they are being careful uh, what they do with the with the money. The bankers don't just love to keep the money in the in the vault of the central bank. They, they would have love to impact. Most of them, let me put it that way, would have love to impact the economy. But the truth is sometimes finding uh, an asset, I mean a, a company that you can give your money to. So that can be difficult. This this takes me to things about record keeping. The, the kind of entrepreneur, in fact, it's not the reason why I have started a lot, because I feel like those people are doing business with me, and they're going to fund, they don't even keep record. And now, if you go to a bank and say, lend me money without any record, they want to do something that sort of convey them that it won't be a bad credit. If they don't have that kind of asset, they will definitely keep their money to themselves. If they are not convinced, they will, the money is not their own. It's, like you abroad, a lot of people abroad, a lot of people in the country who has worked their pension funds and everything are in, the, in those banks. If one bank goes down, that's how we are going to know how impactful they, they could be on the whole economy. Yeah, but now let's say now um, there's a high school graduate 
he has this idea, this big idea that, you know, he can start making money or like maybe even, you know, start employing other people, but he doesn't have the funds to do it. How does he go about with the bank in order to, you know, get this, get the funds in order to transform this idea into a business? I, I will first of all say that it should not be a starting point. Uh, for some reasons, I mean, some idea, but there are currently platforms in the Gambia uh, that could help you. Uh, one of them or two of them I would recommend one of them is a Gambia Startup Incubator. I've, I've worked with them La, last year. I, think I was at their seminar during the Entrepreneurship Summit where I presented a paper there. So that they are doing very well. And the new project, they also started again. Gambia Youth uh, Entrepreneurship Fund, something like a project. That all these projects are there to help young people because these are things which bankers will not do. Bankers don't look at green field ideas. You don't just take a new idea because the risk is very high. It yes. may fail, it may not fail. Yes. The new person who has an idea and he decided to divert the fund help. So the state bankers come in is when somebody develops their idea, it becomes marketable and the banks are convinced. So it's something about them to create, create a platform. I've been in Nigeria, I've seen so many youth fund platforms with government, government does across various sectors. So I think if you want to drive using the uh, entrepreneurship, uh, apart from training, we need to create forms, both government and private sector. I think private sector out there who also will put some risk capital together. We can form a fund where youths who have certain ideas and we feel like they are serious, we can provide them some sort of startup capital that they can start and grow their business. If they grow up, bankers will definitely knock on their door one day. All right. Um, just like you were just saying about Nigeria, it's like the banking capital of Africa. I mean, it is home to the biggest banker in Africa, Tony Elunelu. Yes, and um, in, Nigeria, in Nigeria, I think they have about 24 banks or even more than that now. The last time I knew it was 24 banks. And one of the biggest banks over there, which is Ecobank, is in 36 countries in Africa. And I think they have one in France. They have a branch in France yeah. also. Yeah. You know? yeah. So what is it about the Nigerian banking? You stay over there. You work in the Nigerian banking industry. What is it about their banking industry that you think that if we can apply to the way banking is done in Gambia, it will kind of move us from one step to the next step? Nigeria, Nigeria banking is a, they, they are doing, they are, let me say, they have a lot of great moves which have a replica effect on other industries. For example, the technology industries, they are, they are doing very well with mobile money, uh, with the banking sector is still not uh, very uh, really active on that. They've also allowed a lot of uh, startup companies to create applications which could be hooked into their link their own banking platform. For example, an instant pay. Uh, those kind of instant pay, if you go to the supermarket, some people use POS. Now I've seen something like Pay with Capture, something like Visa. Try just simply use a barcode and market the video account and pay the vendor's account. These are things that have created job in other sector, like the, the startup world. And if you've mentioned about uh, somebody like Tony, he, he started a, a very good foundation in, in Nigeria, which he has now taken it across the world, uh, Africa. That they call T Tony Elemelu uh, Foundation. Yes. He's now from a lot of startup startups from his uh, from his own world and some of his partners. Yes. But I other thing Nigeria Bank also did they are, they are trying to move very fast on, on governance. Uh, I think a lot of development we could do even at the central bank uh, level, that central bank of the Gambia to to, to sort of challenge I'll call it challenge the banking sector to, to, to move up. Uh, product development they did very well. A lot of products are now playing key role in the market. Some of them I know it will take time in the Gambia but we need to have like a, a strategic plan and a direction when are we going to be there. The, 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 the stock market in the country, we only stock market right now in the country because we need to develop the money market itself. The money market is very vibrant. They have a, a secondary market for treasury bills where people can easily buy and it's active. They have a secondary market for, 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 for bonds. And on the government's that I recently introduced a what you call uh, BVN, a bank identification, which make it easy for them to track because you have one number that everybody has as a as a bank account for that is unique to you. If you go to every bank, you they know this number you have. So it means today if government want to check all my financial activities according to this they can use that number 
and they'll be able to flag. I think it is very important for compliance and governance governance issues. These are some initiatives we need to look up in in India because the, the world market is the financial market is moving across the globe, and if you don't do certain initiatives, other parts of the world they will and they can be moved for us to start the pay. All right. Uh, one thing that you mentioned is mobile banking. We saw the um, the M-Pesa in Kenya, yeah, yeah, which exactly. is which is really big. I mean, it is it is making huge strides right now. And I'm not sure whether, whether it is in Nigeria yet, but um, do you think that we can have something like the M-Pesa in in Gambia sometime soon? No, I don't think. Keep money have their own. They still sell. Okay. Still sell. Still sell their own. But we need to promote them because it. Uh, we need to create more awareness about uh, it. I think also at scale and GDP have something similar. You know, Nigerians are doing great. I've got about mobile money platforms uh, across the country. But what I like about the mobile money platform, it creates uh, more financial awareness and it includes also the communities, the small vendors, uh, people like me from it. If you have this kind of mobile money, you can easily transfer money to at, at, the, at, at the village at a very yeah, effective and a, a very secure, secure way. So to be able to have to access to banking, yeah, I think that will be everybody hopes for. Oh, okay. Now, one thing that I've seen you write, um, that you wrote about, was about robots, and uh, here we call it artificial intelligence. Sure. Like, do you think with the way artificial intelligence is going now that the way we know banking, you know, like the like the brick and mortar, yeah. like do you think they are in any kind of uh, maybe extinction or something like that? Like, do you think there's a future for brick and mortar banking? I mean, in in, in Africa, we still have a long way to go because these are things that are currently in the US and some developed country. But no matter how long it takes, it will, it will enter into Africa as well. Yes. Because the thing is, the people who own the bank, they are looking for uh, profitability, they are looking for productivity, they are looking to allocate their resources on other things that uh, will not take up their time. At Fisa Intelligence, we've seen how they are doing very well in, in the US, yes. also some great products. We serve you a tea, you just simply go to the machine to come and give you a tea, the tea you want. Yeah. And you also come into banking, but there are some jobs in banking that you can easily automate uh, if, if everything is put into consideration. You can like, things like compliance. Yes. You can automate compliance. You can automate uh, back office, office job. Um, all these things, it, it, you will be surprised in 10, 15 years' time if you see bankers reduce the manta and increase the robot in, in those uh, job functions. You can do this for a man part one and do what they have done. But you will see more of us probably those two are so it will be delayed because Africa and our infrastructure we are still uh, way behind. But whether it's 30 years or 40 years, they will definitely will end up in our market just like other technologies have done. Right, wow. All right, so um, now I just want you to do a little bit of breakdown for me because there are different types of banks out there, and you know, people may not understand how these banks work. I mean, most of us, what we know is just have a checking and a savings account. You know, you just put your money there. When it's time to take it out, you go and take it out. But we have, of course, every country has a cent uh, central bank. You also have corporate banks. You have retail banks. You have credit unions. You have investment banks. How will you differentiate these things in layman's terms so that folks can understand? Yeah, okay. If you look at the first of the world, central bank, uh, central bank, most of their function is to work for government. Yes. Work to stabilize the economy. They, they have a key role, and they, in some countries also, they become the ability of the commercial banks or all the other, all the other banks. In some countries, a different uh, unit, like in, in the US, in the UK, they have the FAC, it's not the central bank, or not the Bank of England, but it was the ability of the other bank. The corporate bank, most of their aims and goals, most of this will look at it from their aims and goals, that the clients they want to serve. So at the end of the day, all the banks have one major fund, so maybe we know is the intermediate. But the corporate banks, their aim is mostly to serve the big client. Yes. 
So we should go there as a small island or as an individual. We may not be most good time from them because their aim is they are living with customers. Uh, let's say if you look at the global level, they are talking about uh, FOB, they are talking about BP, or they are talking about Facebook and Apple too. They, they are looking for big, big clients. If you go to a global level, most of the banks, they combine this together. They, they have them as a department, they have a bank, they have a corporate department, or they have a global sales department. A retail bank want to serve the small SME is an individual client, who you can call them consumers. That, those are the kind of the target. And this also affects the kind of product they will normally sell out. A, a, a corporate banker will talk about things like syndication. Uh, a retail banker will talk about consumer loan, car loan, come for higher purchases, mortgage. Those products you hardly see them in, 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 a, in, a, in a corporate bank. is once in a blue moon. If I would make a, 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 a comparison, I would take somebody like Stanchard Gambia, that looks more like a corporate bank, because most of the clients are corporate clients. But you, you take somebody like a, a, a GTO or, or, or Trust Bank, they are like a retail bank. But if I see the open plan, it's all over the, the country. That's well, one thing you know about retail bank. They want open plan, it's all over the country or the community. They have so many ATMs. But the corporate bank can hardly do those kind of things. Investment bank has. They have some similarity with the corporate banker. The, the difference is their focus is mostly to raise money and they do some advisory. If you want to raise uh, a big money, either in a form of bond or in a form of a, a, a syndication, you can approach an investment banker. So, again, investment banker is most of the time is not meant for an, an, an individual. They may have a product that will serve the individual, but that's not made for them. So that's why the investment bank also they have uh, divisions or departments. That's why like things like mutual funds comes in where you can face uh, with the with the with the whole series of retail product. Microfinance is credit union at the lowest level, at the community level. Uh, if you look something like uh, Alliance in the Gambia, it's a microfinance. And look at Supersonic. Normally, uh, having access to that product is normally easier because they will, they won't have to open an account with one thousand dollars. They probably say fifty dollars, hundred dollars. They also give you a small loan as well. You, you hardly go to a microfinance, they will give you a $5 million loan. It's, it's not common in the Gambia. Uh, if you want a $5 million, probably you will go to the bigger bank. So, this is where the difference is. So, at the end of the day, the most important thing for me, for most individuals, is where are you? Why is it done? This question is very important because each and every one of us, we are at one stage or the other. Because in this generation, you can't say, I don't think I can open an account in a bank because for whatever level you are, if your salary is thousand dollars or five hundred dollars in a month, there is a bank for you. You can start with a microfinance. You start saving fifty dollars there, hundred dollars there. Whatever thing you save, something will add on that. If you are earning ten thousand dollars in a month, you can either go to microfinance or you go to a commercial bank in the country. If you are earning a one dollars in a month, that one is a big one or a big girl. You can now think of something else because you may probably feel that the commercial bank may not give you enough return. You can now start thinking of looking for products outside the country. There is no boundary to where I can invest your money in this modern world. All right. Um, one thing I would like you to touch on before we um, move to personal finance and your book, of course, is the GDP growth rate in the Gambia. Uh, we've seen that it is projected to um, increase, and it hasn't increased, I think, since 2012. Okay. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, I mean, there are, there are, there are potentials, because the, the change of government, when we had a previous government, some people have uh, uh, different perceptions about the government. When investors are coming to any country, the first thing they looked at is the, is the government. Mm -hmm. so if they feel they, they, they are confident enough to invest in that country, they will bring more money. This is whether you are a Gambian or you are not a Gambian. There are so many Gambians out there who they don't want to bring their money into the country. Yes. So these people are now coming. You see, some people have initiated different platform. This effect of these actions is going to affect our GDP. We have seen, of course, foreign aid coming. Effects of this action is going to affect our GDP because each and every action is giving somebody confidence that I can come to Gambia. I have been blogging for since 2015. But the number of messages I receive from people inquiring about Gambia in 2017 alone is far more than what I've received in the past uh, uh, other years. Everybody's asking me, which sector can I come into 
why which, which product is good or which product how does it work in the country so and as a culture i've seen from the uh, the government report as well they also have a culture also to, to boost and i i think we are certainly going to grow if, if with the right implementations of the policies we will definitely going to grow the gdp in other few years time to come do you have confidence in this government that they can do that i i think so at least for now the direction they've started i i have i have some confidence because the whole lot of changes we are we are we are going through at the at the moment or let me see started since the new government came in is is sometimes not easy because uh uh you see they will say Rome was not built in a day yes. so if all of us acknowledge that certain things we are not right before if those changes are coming to come it's not only one area because it's not only about economy you have to look at social issues you have to look at the uh health issues, legal issues, before we face up all this, my, my major hope or my belief is that we are going to see more impact in the next uh, next government, whether it's going to be the same government going back, but be, I expect to see more impact in the next government because I'm assuming that this government should make all the groundwork that we need for us to take Gambia to uh, another level. But we've seen the kind of people they, they for currently, I, I got a message that uh, they are doing a, a survey on diaspora. They want to have an idea about where are Gambians right now, what are the kind of skills they have, what are the talents they have, so that what are, what are they doing in the outside, so that they can develop a 10 year strategy that will be able to get involved with diaspora in the development of the country. And this was something I wrote, I wrote about uh, in August. So I was very happy when I saw that they are doing that uh, program right now. And it's also involved from very well uh, known Gambian like Professor Fall, I think he's in he's in London. Yes. He's working with the with the government, which um, um as a Gambian I'm very proud of that we need to know where we are because people are doing very well across the globe mm -hmm. if we can all come together. And if they continue and develop that strategy for various sectors apart from diaspora, they go and look at the youth issues, entrepreneurship, technology, they look at the whole economy together. I believe if we implement them we should be able to uh another Gambia which is going to help all of us. Well, hopefully you do not uh, count yourself out because I think you will also be a very good resource. I mean, a lot of people have learned from you, from um, information on your website. What can you tell us about the website? How did it come about? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was there in 2015. So when I traveled to Ghana, I spoke to one of my brother. Uh, he, he's going to be in, in, in Dakar. Uh, he used to lecture at the University of the Gambia before he left. So he's, he... We spoke about issue of personal finance that's uh, around the Gambia. He said, you know what, this is a program. Let's start at the University of the Gambia. So I went to the University of the Gambia. I presented a, uh, a seminar there, like a three hour seminar to the students. I think Echo Master, they, they have this kind of a situation there. I presented the to them and they are very happy. So I don't appreciate what the paper was about. Then it now motivated me. I said, you know what, if these people are having this, I imagine these university students. What's happening to those who do not have the opportunity to go to university? Then I say, you know what, let me start a blog. Let me start to write something about this frequently. Then I started that in 2015. 2016, I went back again. I met a number of students in Gambia College, the agricultural students. They are also very happy. So anytime I keep on writing, a lot of people give me uh, feedback. So overall, I feel that because our current education system is not teaching us about personal finance and business development, we have to do it one way or the other because if you look at in the West, they, they've added as part of their curriculum that they teach personal finance and I'm hoping that one day the, the government is going to consider it as part of our curriculum. If we can't do it at the junior or senior school, why don't we start at the Gambia College and University of the Gambia where they learn about uh, personal finance and management because they are very important critical issues. I always imagine Somebody goes to school for 14 or 15 years. Uh, now you start receiving your salaries and you don't know how to manage that money. It's, it's, it's kind of look very painful because almost all of us, we suffered a lot to get to earn that education and started working. So the output or the compensation from that 14 or 15 years schooling, you now put it to waste. In fact, if I'm allowed to put it that way, I think it's, it's a bit painful. And you can't blame them sometimes because nobody ever taught them about it. Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, personal finance is um, is something that is very, very important. 
not just for the individual only, but for the country as a whole. I mean, um, just like you said, we were not taught anything about money. You know, most of us came from very, very humble backgrounds. Like so many of us right now, we are making so much money that our parents did not make, you know, during their whole lifetime. You know, that's the amount of money that, that, that we are making. If you don't know how to manage it, I mean, it is just going to go to waste, just like you said. Uh, what are some of the uh, quick tips that you can give us about good money habits and um, wealth building? I think uh, one of the things I would say is about planning. Because you see, if, if you have no plan, you have if you find it difficult to progress, whatever it takes, if, if, if you are going to school, you plan in the morning and say, what socket am I going to have? Is he a good student does that? A good teacher as well will say, I'm planning which socket am I going to lecture today? So if you are also going to the issue of money, you, you have to plan. And planning comes with, you have to have a goal. What fine some goal do you want to have? It depends on your age. People have different goals. Your, your, your goal may be as simple as you want to save 10,000 dollars in 2018. Your goal may be you want to buy your first land in 2018 because you feel like you'll be working. You know, somebody's goal may be I want to go to school to develop myself. So you have to plan. If you have a plan which you are trying to pursue, and the plan has to include a, a means, or let me say, the means of achieving that particular goal. Another important thing you have to do is to avoid comparing yourself with others. That's one of the things I find very, very uh, important. I, I not just wake up and compare my myself with other people, what they have, because I don't know how they get their money. I don't know how they get their assets. So I focus on my goals. If I want to achieve something, remember, I told you that after my senior school, nobody paid school fee for me. Yeah. My ACC, my CAT, my master's, my fourth degree, I paid everything by myself. It wasn't like I was paid very well. It's simply because I planned that these are education I want to have. Then I couldn't afford to go to a pro to go and pursue education. I think that doesn't mean I can't plan for money to decide to pay something and acquire more knowledge. So, but I don't compare myself with any other person. I feel like I am on my own. I'm growing as long as I'm improving. It's good for me. You also have to avoid loans. That's the consumer loans. I always tell people there are two types of loans. You have the good loans and the bad loans. If you take a loan simply for you to go and buy uh, a new phone, except you are in the business that requires phone. But just to say iPhone X is out, you want to go and buy a new iPhone X, I don't think it's financially wise because you are taking a loan to buy something that will not add any other value. It's only taken from you. Before you know, iPhone X1 or X2 is, is coming out, which will make your iPhone X look outdated. Are you going to buy a new iPhone? Of course, some people do it. They will go and trade that other one out. Or you go and use a loan to, to go for holiday credit card or any other loan, consumer loan, these are loans basically they don't add value. But if you look at an investment loan, the value added loan, you take that loan, you buy a property, the property increase in value or a land, or the property generate rental income for you. Or you take that loan, you go and buy or invest in education and the education is going to give you more awareness, add value to you, become a better employee or a better entrepreneur. I think if if we focus on these things, they will they will definitely help. There is a whole lot of tips because we don't have much time. But a whole lot of tips I put that out there on my on my on my website, and I'm working on the next one. Like I think if you can see, you're already for 2017. I'm working on 2018 of the, the article which will be out very soon. All right. The website name is businessingambia.com. I have learned a lot from it, and hopefully, folks will. Um, Go in there and look at some of the articles that you have. Very, very helpful. Before we um, close, I would like you to talk a little bit about your book. It's is um, a really good book um, called Past 12 Proven Secrets to Pass Any Professional Exam at the First Sitting. What can you tell us about this book? So, I mean, this book is something that I got the inspiration from um, the youth in the Gambia. It's, it's not something that comes from only me because uh, when I finished senior school, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, I was not able to go to the University of the Gambia, even though I had an admission to study economics and finance. Then due to lack of funding, I had to drop out of the University of the Gambia after spending like one semester. Yeah? 
But I now say, you know what, let me go out and look for jobs. I went to search for jobs. The first job I got was to be a teaching assistant in Nusrat High School then. From Nusrat High, I was lucky to have a job in GTB. And once I was in GTB, I said to myself, I have to develop myself. I cannot just be in the bank and think that I'm okay now. Then I followed the CAD route from the certified accounting technician. Then I went into ACC. The I was doing a full-time banking job, so I cannot go and attend a full-time class. And then Gambia, I, I don't know of any part-time. So everything I did was through self-study, basically to put it, to cut the long story. So I studied the ACC through self-study, just by the book, ask people around. And that's how I was able to pass all my six exams. Uh, at the first attempt, I didn't repeat any paper. Then, of course, my colleagues, my young people here about this, people keep on asking me. Uh, I know, like, somebody in Israel is a chemical, keep on telling people, oh, I know this guy, he did this thing without going for any classes. So, a lot of people keep on asking me questions, how do I do it? Then that was how I first wrote an article about the whole thing. Then I wrote the article, still people keep on asking me. I said to myself, you know what, this is like a challenge for me. If young guys are asking me this, why don't I put a book out there? that they could benefit from it. No, even if I don't have uh, time to respond to everybody, I could easily refer them to, to that book. So that was how I came up with this book. And I also researched beyond my own uh, understanding I, about the art of learning and passing exam. I researched from different prof uh, professors around the globe. I put all those things together. I've also asked the opinion of some other professionals we have been together and make this as a book. I got it published on Amazon uh, this year, October, and in November it, it, it became a bestseller on three, three categories uh, in the US. And my plan is now to publish it in Gambia next year so that it will be very sort of accessible to, to, to the young people in the Gambia. Well, I mean, we're really proud of that, man. I mean, the job that you're doing is fabulous, man. This book. I mean, um, it's a five star on Amazon. Um, it has been customer reviewed by 23 people already, but I was, I was very disappointed. Um, of all those 23 reviews, I went through all of them. I didn't see any with a Gambian name. You know? <laughs> Most of them are just foreign people. I mean, how do you feel about that? That as a Gambian, you know, you wrote this with, with Gambia, like behind the thinking and there's no Gambian review on Amazon. 23 of them, none of them are Gambian. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so you, I, would, I would have been more proud, like you said, if I see a, a, a Gambian comment on it. Uh, but like you said, that's the role what, like yourself, myself, and a million people are playing today for us to be able to create more awareness for the Gambian community that there are whole lot of things we are missing. The, the important thing for you is not about only this book, but it also gives you a signal that how many Gambians are out there reading. How many of us are reading? We need to develop ourselves. Yes. We have to read. We have to read. I always think that we have to read. And on average, in a in in a, in a month, on average, I, I read a book. Yes. On average, so we are, we are so in a year minimum, I read twelve books. That's good. Books from different backgrounds. I have a thousand to do. So I will see a book at cheap as one dollars, two dollars, yes. four dollars. I just buy it. I read it. I have learned something from it. So I think my message would be to Gambians out there, we have to start reading. If you ask any great, successful, whether it's spiritual, business, sport, they will tell you they read. They so participate in something that develops the mind. Because if you read, it develops the mind. And if your mind is developed, you can think of anything. Yeah, that's right. Think of anything that would give you anything you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. That's right, man. Yeah, I mean, somebody once told me that reading is like an exercise for the brain. And then um, readers are the leaders. If you read, you end up becoming a leader. So now uh, before we close, Mr. Sawane, I would just like you, I would just like to ask some questions just to, just to pick on your brain. So okay. since we are on the topic of reading, tell me what books are on your reading list right now. Right now, um, I'm reading the conference book called Success Principle. Yes, 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 yes. I have that's, that book over here with me. Very good book. That, that, the, that, that book is where my, I would say my life started yes. changing. I started reading that book in 2014, so I'm reading it once more time. Yes. 
um, also in the the, the cash flow quadrant of uh, Robert uh, Kiyosaki. Robert Kiyosaki, which dad for that? <laughs> for that, exactly. Yeah. Um, I'm reading that, reading that too. I, am, I have a plan also to read uh, Mr. Drame's book, the book he sent to me yesterday, that the life of one Yes, Jamal Drame. That's also, this is, this is on my, my reading list that I want to do in early 2018. Yes. Uh, I'm also in, I'm planning to read another Gandhian Otto's book, uh, that's for the ballet, that's the, the student companion, because my, my English. Uh-huh. And I'm also working on other book, The Art of Public Speaking. In fact, one of the plans I have in 2018 is to work on my public speaking skills. So I've joined a Toastmaster club in, in Lagos here. Good. Toastmaster helped you to, to improve your leadership and your public speaking skills. I, I did my... I spoke a speech yesterday and it was it was okay. So I want to read more public speaking to encourage myself because I feel like I have uh, ideas and opinions which can help a lot of young people, uh, not only in Gambia but across Africa or let's see in the, in the globe. So I need to find a way of how can I deliver those messages because the content is important but how you also communicate it is also very critical. All right. I mean, you mentioned Toastmasters, man. That is like really good for anybody who wants to um, master public speaking. I will really recommend that you go to Toastmasters. I am about to sign up for myself. Um, there's one just right, right um, close to my house, so I'll be signing okay. up for that. Do you belong to any mastermind group? Yeah, I have one mastermind group on on Facebook. Uh, funny enough, is they are based in US. They are called. Uh, the school of uh, self-publishing. That was how I even learned the art of how to publish my books. Good. On 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 Amazon. It's from that mastermind group. I mean, these are things I'm hoping that we could start in in the Gambia because I, I know there are some groups, but they may not be as active as the, the way we hope uh, yes. they should be. So these mastermind groups are very very important. Yes. You could learn a lot. So I have that here. I, I, I'm currently adding that one with the, with the post master. And I think so far so good is that too I'm I'm focusing on, but um I'm open to any group that can make use of technology because of, because of locations. That's why I like that group. You don't have to meet physically. Yes. You just meet through a a Hangout, uh, Google Hangout call to, uh, on a weekly basis. But it's it's, it's going uh, very good so far so good. All right, well that's great. Just let me know if there's anything I can do to help in terms of uh, starting one in the Gambia. I mean, they are very, very helpful. I mean, sharing sharing ideas and those kind of things are very, very helpful. So my last question is: Can you tell me a movie? Whenever it's on on TV, you have to watch it. It's funny enough. Is uh, I would say it's an Indian movie called Three Idiots. What's the name again? Indian movie Three Idiots. Three idiots. <laughs> yeah, because see, because what I like, well, I, I am very passionate about education. They are they are trying to they they, they went to a school in Zimbabwe and they to summarize it. These are three boys. They went to a school, uh, a very competitive school where people have been taught you have to be very competitive for you to make it in life. But one of the boys say, you know what? I don't believe that you don't have to be so competitive for you to make it in life. We we have to know we are learning with our. our our brains are not piece of cookers, that's what the boy used to say. Yes. So I love that movie because it's telling me the kind of educational system we have in, let's say, in Africa, we need to change them. It's, it's no more about competition in, 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 in school. If I have my way, I will probably start a school that nobody will be given a position to say who is first, who is last, or who is second. Because I believe everybody is a peculiar person. We, we have various space at which you can absorb information. And we are also different talents. Some people are good in social, some people are good in mathematical, some people are good in, in other stuff. So that movie taught me a lot about the kind of education system we have uh, across the globe. Oh, that's great, man. I mean, I really appreciate you taking the time, man, talking to me today. Um, I've taken so much of your time, but um, I've learned so much from you also, and I hope the audience will also be able to learn a lot about some of the things that you've said. I will just let you um, do your closing remarks, whatever you want to um, tell to the folks out there. And, uh, I will say thank you once more uh, for organizing this uh, very educate, uh, educative uh, platform because I've listened to uh, bankers, uh, discussion with bankers, and it was very good around the web building, which I agree with most of his opinion there. And I'll put it to the young people because I feel like most of my my target audience are young people because we are the future leaders of, uh, of Africa. Uh, we have to be 
prepared. We, on our own individual ways, we should be ready because we, there is a lot more coming. A lot of changes are coming around the globe, whether we want it or not, we will be part of it. Uh, whilst we are thinking about the arts, some people are thinking about the, the other space out there. So we have a lot of responsibilities coming from us. If we want to see changes in Africa, we have to be involved and we have to be involved with all our hearts, all our passion, not for ourselves, but for our community. Uh, the generations who are coming to benefit from our work. When you always hear about what's sustainable, if for us to be able to start something with generations to come in the future can benefit from. So whatever thing you are doing, if you rethink along that line, we should be able to create value for ourselves, which our kids, our grandkids will be able to benefit from those uh, efforts in the future. All right, that's a powerful message, man. Um, hopefully folks will let that sink in. Um, I really appreciate the time, Ibrahim. I, I wish we had more time. I'm sure we will uh, we'll get in touch privately, and we will talk about so many other things. So, but this uh, is uh, this is this is the time that we have today for the program. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time doing this, and uh, hopefully, uh, we will get to meet sometime soon. Uh, th thank you very much. I really appreciate for giving me the opportunity to see my again. No problem, man. You take care now. All right. Okay then. All right.